Hello. Thanks for joining me today. I have had a recent shift in my life. I recently moved into a new place, a new home, and I have a whole bunch of stuff that's in boxes, uh, specifically books with, that I need to unpack and fill my bookshelves with. And so I was thinking in the interest of being in a new place, perhaps, hopefully, reconfirming old habits in regards to ASMR videos, I would try filming some videos of unpacking and talking about some of the books in my collection. So, I suppose, without further ado, we'll get started here. I don't have a... I don't really know what's in each box. I sort of just put books of similar size in each box, and I figured I'd figure it out when I got here. So I'll just start picking some books out at random and talk about the ones that I find interesting. So. First random book is a book I haven't read. This is City of Weird uh, and 30 Otherworldly Portland Tales. It's sort of funny that I have this. I Some years ago I was considering moving to the Pacific Northwest and I think this book came from that effort when I was learning more about the area, and I don't live in Portland now. I live probably close enough that it makes sense to have this, but I don't know when I'm going to read it. But, uh, oh, there's a gift receipt in here that says that I got this as a gift. Looks like, ah, looks like 2016, which, um, yeah, that's, that's about the right timeline. So it's a history book, but it's a history of the weird stuff about Portland. Uh, and I wish I could tell you what some examples are, but I don't. I, I don't. I don't know. And the table of contents doesn't really... The titles are a little abstract, so they don't really illustrate it, but uh, there's a story called Octopolis? Apocalypse, a love story. How I got this job. The sky is so blue. How do you say gentrification in Martian? Mind body problem. Squatty and weasel boy. The deflowering. Notes from the underground city. We'll see if I ever get around to reading it. Next random book. 
Hard Boiled Wonderland and The End of the World. This one is by Haruki Murakami. This is not one of his most famous books. Uh, he's sort of famous for, um, well, he's internationally renowned. All, his, all of his works are translated to English. But I believe they're originally written in Japanese. And uh, he's known for being fairly dreamlike in the way he writes narratives being played out. I believe one of his more famous books is Kafka on the Shore, which I read within the last couple of years uh, and did not care for. But I got this book when I was younger and I enjoyed it. If I remember correctly, this book is unique in that there are no character names. Uh, the author uses just descriptions of the different characters and their attributes to make them recognizable later on. And I remember noticing that, I think, halfway through reading it and being somewhat impressed by it. Honestly, it's been long enough since I read this, which I think was when I was a teenager, that I don't remember anything that happens in it. I have a map here. I'm not sure what it's a map of. Well, it says the end of the world, so I guess it's a map of the end of the world. Don't know why I asked. I should try reading this again to see how it compares to Kafka on the Shore. Alright, next one. Ah! <laughs> so, Fight Club, uh, that happens to be styled based on the movie, so... If you pick up this copy, you don't get to have a picture in your head of what the characters look like. They're right, they're right there. You just, that's who you get to picture. Um, this one is by Chuck Palahniuk, who I also read, I've I read other books of his also when I was younger, I think in college. and. He's definitely an intriguing author. Very distinctive writing style. I will say, Fight Club is one of the few books, however, that I enjoyed the movie more than the book at the time. I was in college, and I was just discovering movies for the first time, too. I mean, discovering, I don't know, I was... I had a Netflix subscription for the first time, which at the time uh, was, DV was a DVD mailing service. And so I was just devouring as many movies as I could. There was a specific summer that I tried watching every movie I could get my hands on that seemed culturally significant. And this was one of them, and I loved the movie. I have learned since then that I relate to that movie in a different way than maybe some other demographics do, but I, I think the movie is well-crafted. The storytelling is very good. Uh, in this book, there's not as compelling a narrative rhythm or a sense of conflict or twist. So, I don't know, but probably a lot of these books I'm gonna, I read when I was younger and might have a, 
different perspective on if I were to read it now as a slightly more mature adult. I'm not really sure. My cat is causing problems. This is my cat, Prince. He's not part of this video. Okay. Mm. This is Sin City. It is book book one of the Sin City graphic novel series. This is the one featuring my favorite character from Sin City. Uh, and this is another one where I watched the movie first. And then... Uh, and, then what, and then read the comic book. And I don't think I even read the entire comic book. But the... Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know... I mean, if you've seen the movie, you know how stylized it is. Uh, it is very styled to match what the comic book looks like with these heavy, dramatic shadows. I also haven't seen the movie for a long time. I don't know if I would like it as much as when I was younger. But I did really like this character whose name I can't quite remember, so... It's not that I don't read any of the books I have. I really have read most of them, and I have read this, but I guess most of the hard copies I have of anything came from longer ago, because I do tend to buy more electronic copies of everything these days, including comic books. I, I definitely, there's been a lot of discussion lately online about how, I mean there probably always is, but lately uh, there have been some streaming services and such that have taken different beloved shows just off the services, and so there's a lot of discussion about how that, that that's why we need a hard copies of things, because it's so easy for electronic media to just disappear at the whims of a corporation. And I tend to agree with that. Uh, the limiting factor for myself, and I think a lot of people, is... Well, space. Uh, and... In this new place I've moved into, I have more space than I used to, but uh, like right now, I only have my two bookshelves, and in order to get more, I'm going to have to reconfigure my space. I need taller bookshelves. Anyway, it's going to be expensive, and it's going to be um, an ordeal. And, Depending on your lifestyle, you may or may not be able to install bookshelves, and uh, anyway, um, so right now, convenience wins out. I imagine well, as I get older, I don't know, I'd like to be one of those people that have just a big library, like lots of bookshelves, a ladder to get to the top that like slides along. That'll be like something I have when I'm old, old, like retirement age or whatever. All right, this is The Dice Man by Luke Reinhardt. I read this, I believe, in between high school and college. Uh, I guess it's a book from the 70s. I think it's sort of edgy. It's about someone who starts making all of the decisions in their life based on the result of a dice roll. They roll a dice that they carry, a, 
a die that they carry around in their pocket or something. Uh, I don't remember the protagonist being likable. In fact, I don't remember much about this book at all. Um, it says, born psychiatrist Luke Reinhardt lives with his wife and two children in their slightly upper, slightly east apartment in Manhattan. Dissatisfied with both Western and Eastern philosophies, alternately embracing the meaningfulness and meaninglessness of life, Luke is forever changed when he finds religion through the simple roll of the die and is stunned and converted as only the utterly bored can be. Um, I don't remember it well enough to say if I can recommend this or not, and I'm not likely to read it again, so I should probably give this one away or something. Oh, this is not a novel or anything, it's just a, uh, it's an instruction book, watercolors. It's, um, how to paint in watercolors. Oh, there's some color. I never got into doing watercolors uh, very much myself, but I adore watercolor art. It could be some of the most beautiful form of painting ever, 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 ever. So I've, I've, I've made the attempt to, to try it out a couple times. Um, Oh, uh, a recommendation. If you're into watercolor ASMR videos, Swarms ASMR has a lovely uh, series of watercolor videos. Are they a series? I think she has more than one. And, uh, and they're just lovely and very peaceful to watch. This really shouldn't go on my bookshelf. This should go with my art supplies. So I'm going to put that somewhere else. Another comic book. This one is Attack on Titan, the first, the first one. I have seen the first three seasons of Attack on Titan, and keep meaning to catch up, but I haven't yet. It's a very uh, for those who don't know, it's a very um, action-packed, uh, very well animated anime about a giant, these giant creatures, titans, that attack these communities of, of normal-sized humans, and um, they're really scary. They're just, they're just beautiful. Um, there's a giant giant wall around the city um, to keep titans out, uh, but as the story progresses, the titans become more and more of a threat. It's very exciting, very visceral, the, the fighting styles are really fun to watch. Uh, yeah, I got a lot out of this. I haven't, um, I haven't watched it for a few years. I stopped watching when there wasn't any more to watch, but then when it picked up again, I didn't, I didn't go back to it, haven't gone back to it yet. Uh, let's see. Gorillas in the Mist by Diane Fossey. So, uh, I know this is a film, and this cover is a photograph from the film, but 
the, the book itself is a memoir from a naturalist who studied uh, gorillas in the Congo, I believe. Mm. No, Uganda and Zaire and Rwanda. Uh, so that was, and it was a long time ago. It was, um, well, this book was written probably in the 80s, but I think she did her research in the 60s. I don't remember. Um, but it was one of the crucial popularizations of primate studies and uh, taught people in general a lot about other primates and animal cognition and our similarities to them. Uh -oh. Gorilla. I haven't read this book, though. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> That's one of the ones I never quite got to. I know of it. I guess a little bit, and that's it. Mm. This is Life of Pi, Jan Martel, and this I believe has a movie now. I haven't seen the movie, but the book is about a young boy who gets lost at sea um, with on a lifeboat with only a tiger for a company, because uh, there happened to be a tiger on the boat that he, that sank, that he was on. And I remember really enjoying it. Uh, this was another one I read in college, so my memory of it is not amazing. But I remember it being really, it's, it's an adventure book, essentially and plays out like an adventure book. He goes on an adventure on the, o in, on the ocean. Sort of in the same genre as, I don't know, Hatchet, which is a much smaller book. This has a lot more meat to it. Um, Castaway, the movie, you know, he's trying to survive in a hostile environment and finds some wonders along the way. All right, this is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And if I'm not mistaken, this is primarily a collection of thoughts from his journal, diary. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher, I believe he also became emperor, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, written in Greek by the only Roman emperor who was also a philosopher, without any intention of publication. The meditations of Marcus Aurelius offer a remarkable series of challenging spiritual reflections and exercises developed as the emperor struggled to understand himself and make sense of the universe. Uh, it was written, or Marcus Aurelius lived from AD 121 to 180, so a long time ago, and I think he is known for his stoic philosophy I may have featured this book in a previous video. Look, I found a leaf. I guess I was pressing a leaf for some reason. I don't know why I did that. It was like paper thin. Oh, well, it's on this page. Let's see. Let's see. But these are organized in like little, just little blurbs, essentially. Like, each one of these is a little thought, uh, separate, disconnected from the other. So one of these is, your principles are living things. 
How else could they be deadened except by the extinction of the corresponding mental images? And the constant rekindling of these is up to you. I am able to form the judgment I should about this event. If able, why troubled? All that lies outside my own mind is nothing to it. Learn this and you stand upright. You can live once more. Look at things again as you used to look at them. In this is the resumption of life. He says you. I assume he's addressing himself since this is a diary. Another blurb. How many who once rose to fame are now consigned to oblivion? And how many who sang their fame are long disappeared? Do not be ashamed of help. It is your task to achieve your assigned duty, like a soldier in a, in a scaling party. What then if you are lame and cannot climb the parapet by yourself, but this is made possible by another's help? Yeah, I can get behind that. Yeah, so lots of thoughts about stoicism, you know, accepting what is, uh, letting go of things that you can't control, that type of thing. Mm. A big book of Sudoku. <laughs> uh, oh. I guess I've done some of these, but this is... I don't know why I have this. Uh, Sudoku is not really my game. And... Oh, looks like my brother did some of these too. Uh, I, I guess this was just a book that we had, that I had when I was a kid maybe, for doing puzzles on car rides or something. I'm not really sure. Time uh, by <clears throat> Madeline, I don't know how to say her name, Langley. I'm gonna say that, that sounds nice. Uh, fairly famous children's fantasy novel about a family of. Um, gifted and slightly different children. That, uh, there's a whole series. They go on some magical adventures and discover various secrets about the universe. I read the series when I was a kid, but I don't have strong memories of it. I think it involves the protagonist, Meg, going on a search for her dad, who went missing some time ago, and she meets some witches who are actually these creatures. Um, it's a little strange, and as a kid, I remember really, really, really liking it. Uh, I guess this is an old library book that I picked up um, in a library sale. Um, I assume, unless I just kept it from the library, but I, I doubt, I don't, I wouldn't do something like that. Yeah, painfully marked it, yeah. This is The Princess Bride, which I have owned. This is not the first copy of this I've owned. Uh, I think I, I had a copy from one of the original printings in the 80s, I think, 
Um, but it fell apart. Well, it started to fall apart, and then I think I lent it away and never got it back. And so I needed a new copy, so I, so I bought this one. This book I have read so many times, just so many times. I think the first one I, I read when I was 12, and it was one of those books that I just read, like, once a year or so, and it just keeps being good. It never stops being extremely well written, extremely funny, just, just beautiful, compelling, funny writing. I love this book a lot. And the book, I mean, they did a good job with the movie, but the book is so so fleshed out in so many delightful ways. Highly recommend it. One of my one of my all time favorites. Other books turned into movies. This is Holes by Louis Sekar. Louis Sekar. I, I only read this book once, but I read other books of his that I can't quite remember the names of. I, unless I'm misremembering, I think he wrote the book um, Upside, Upside Down Stories from Wayside School. I think that might be the same author. Uh, Anyway, if that's the same guy, then I read that one a lot. Uh, and then Holes is obviously really good. Um, if you've seen the movie, the, the movie's the movie's great. The movie's fantastic. I remember the book being really great. I think the book, the book and the movie are fairly similar in tone. But I only read this once, and it was shortly after the movie came out, and so it was long ago enough that I don't entirely remember anything about it. I remember the movie a lot more. Um, I might read this again at some point. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to read. Let's Pretend This Never Happened by Jenny Lawson, who was a blogger. Oh, yeah, the bloggess. Uh, much of the context around this has slipped my memory. I remember reading the bloggess, and that's why I bought her book. Uh, she was a blogger on during an earlier time on the internet. In the book itself, this book is uh, was released in 2012. So the late aughts, early 2010s, were, were bigger days for blogs, and I think she was a fairly well-known one, and so her blog writing became uh, popular enough that she turned it into a book, or continued with her writing and, and went on to publish a book. Uh, I sort of forgot this existed, and I don't think I read the whole book. Because, well, I don't know. I feel like I would have remembered more about this in general if I'd read the entire book. If you remember anything about the blog S, let me know, because I don't. Hmm. 
This is a book I've definitely never read. Doesn't look familiar to me at all. The Shape of Illusion. I don't know what it is. Or where I got it. This book looks very old. The pages are uneven. They're not... They're all subtly very different sizes and they've got like ragged edges. Is it old enough that that was a feature of this binding? There's no copyright uh, information in the, in the beginning. That's weird. Um, okay, so the summary is, the painting was just as mysterious as the New York art dealer had promised. The work of an obscure German artist, the scene showed Christ leaving the palace of Pontius Pilate under the guard of Roman soldiers, forcing their way through a stone-throwing mob. There was no doubt that it was a true masterpiece of Renaissance art. But for the four people who gathered to view it, the picture possessed a quality that was absolutely unique. As each of them looked upon it, he found himself clearly depicted as one of the howling mob. In this new novel, a young man searched for the secret of the strange genius who created that seemingly magic painting leads him to a beautiful and perfectly intact medieval town in Germany, and finally to the discovery of the most precious gift a person can receive. So may or may not be a book with some religious themes, sound like. William E. Barrett. Uh, William E. Barrett was a successful magazine writer during the 1930s and 40s. I don't know why I have this book. I might, I might have... I don't know why I would have picked it up at a thrift store or something. Um, let me know if you know anything about it, because I, I do not. Let's see. Mm, the Knife of Never Letting Go. I got this book as a gift and, uh, for Christmas once, and uh, I believe it's, it, I remember it being a really easy read. It wasn't, uh, it, it's big, but it's, but it's really easy. I think I flew through it. I'm not sure if it's a young adult novel. I think it might be, but uh, excellent really really good um it's about a world where people well uh, some people's thoughts are clearly audible to others so there's a there's a unwilling telepathy um element in the universe that these characters live in and I found it extremely compelling. I haven't read it for a few years. I might reread it at some point. This is at the Bioneers. Declaration of Interdependence. This was one of my course books in college. I took a bioethics class as part of my biology studies, and this was this was the book that, that it was like our textbook that we were assigned to do readings from, and it basically illustrates um, various cases over the years of. Uh, events where biotechnology had 
a ethical um, dispute or conflict or quandary within it. So chapter one is called Cleopatra's Bathwater. Oh, that's an idiom, I don't, or like a phrase, I don't know what that refers to. But the subsections are John Todd's Alternative Greenhouse Effect and Donald Hammer's Shallow Ecology. Chapter two is called The Web of Kinship with the subsection Vandana Shiva and the Vision of the Native Seed. Chapter five, From Agribusiness to Agriculture. Some sections, Fred Kirschenman and the Soul of the Soil. And the next section, Anna Eni's Chicken Breath. Chapter seven, Redesigning Society, the Second Industrial Revolution. I, I don't remember much about the writing here. It, the chapters make it sound like there's a definite, definite like, spiritual bent to this book. I, I remember being affected by it in some way, and that's why I hung on to it, but I don't remember like, which particular story was of interest to me. Uh, that class was, was of interest to me in general. Um, uh, it was a very, I remember it being a very effective like, investigation of uh, ethical, ethical questions. And I guess these environmental ethics questions were a part of that. Uh, this must not have been the only book because I remember other sorts of uh, medical ethics questions as well. This one comes from the ancient, ancient past. Uh, Fushigi Yugi was one of the first animes I ever watched when I was very young. I think found it in middle school, and it uh, oh, just even looking at this, it's just the nostalgia is just coming over me in waves. Um, This schoolgirl from Japan uh, goes through, she opens a book, I think, and it takes her back in time to magical ancient China, I believe, where she uh, turns out to be the prophesied priestess of Suzaku. And um, is she, oh, that's my favorite. She has various adventures and kind of collects a uh, uh, the friendships of various beautiful men um, as they help her achieve her mission as the priestess. She's got her, you know, main love interest, and there's also beautiful villains, and everybody's just beautiful. You know how it is. Um, my favorite was Chichiri, who was a monk, and he was silly most of the time, but then he would get deadly serious. And he had a tragic backstory, too. Love that. Uh, oh, and she, she traveled, first traveled with a friend um, who, but they got separated. And uh, what's the protagonist's name? I feel like I should remember. Uh, Miyaka, oh, of course. Miyaka has all the, you know, she becomes the priestess of Suzaku and has all these wonderful, amazing experiences, but her friend Yui uh, ends up in the clutches of the villains and um, she has a bad time and so their friendship is uh, torn asunder by that. I mean, I remember this anime being really good. I don't know if it, no, I don't know if it still would be, but uh, lots of good memories of it. And then. 
I tried to find the comic wherever I could. Sometimes they would be in various uh, uh, manga magazines, which it was hard to get manga back in the day, let me tell you. Um, but then they, then they also eventually came out with graphic novels, so that is just part of my past. Um, my first animes were Sailor Moon, very first one, amazing. Uh, Ranma One Half was another early one. Escaflone, which is a piece of art. Love Escaflone. Uh, not that the others aren't, but the others are good too. Escaflone is fairly notable as a unique anime, though. Um, and Fushigi Yuki. Those, those four were kind of my lifeblood when I was a teenager. This is 1984, George Orwell. Probably have heard about this one before. It's about a dystopian totalitarian government that uh, imposes punishment for things like thought crime uh, and deviating from the prescribed language patterns and you know, restricting various human freedoms. I first read this in high school and enjoyed it. And I think I read it a couple times since then, but I haven't read it for years. But, you know, it's a classic. It, it um, Uh, so this was written in, in 1949, when 1984 was still in the distant future. But if you're interested in what someone from 1949, just after the Second World War, might think of a oppressive totalitarian government and how that would turn out, uh, yeah, recommend it. The Little Prince. <clears throat> uh, this is obviously an amazing book. To me, it's also representative of unfinished projects. Maybe not unfinished forever, but... Um, Was this the bookmark of how far I was? I was almost done. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for context, I have other books about the Little Prince on my channel. If you haven't seen those, um, I they were from a long time ago. I put a lot of work into them, and I should have finished that project. This one is dear to my heart, uh, Black Dogs. Black Dogs is the name of the series. Uh, the House of Diamond is, I guess, the name of this book by Ursula Vernon. There are two books in this series. Ursula Vernon also publishes under the name T. Kingfisher. She is an author I've been following for a very long time. And uh, I found her on the early internet. Uh, oh, oh, 20 years ago, um, and I, when I first followed her, I knew about her art, uh, but then she slowly moved more into writing and became a very prolific author. Uh, she specializes in whimsical fantasy that has dark undertones. Uh, her books, especially lately, have been getting more and more macabre, and they're just, they're beautiful. Her most re one of her most recent books is a retelling of The Fall of the House of Usher. Uh, and it's called What Moves the Dead? 
Definitely recommend that one. Anytime she approaches horror genre, it's always always very good. Uh, but anything she writes is, I don't know, she's just one of those people I've been following for literal decades now, so uh, beloved to me. And this was, this was, I believe, well, it was independently published. She did this art on the cover as well, which generally isn't done for like standard publishing procedures. And if you try to find this book now, it doesn't look like this. There's a there's like a more standard publisher these days. Um, but this is a good series. Um, everything she writes is amazing. If if you like their genre. This is good. Lock picking manual. Useful skills for anyone to know. Uh, of course, you should only pick locks that you yourself own. But, uh, you know, lock picking tools are, are cheap and useful. And it's a fun hobby to get into. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think this might be an abridged version. Let's see, is it? Has it been? Because it looks really small. And if it is, then it's useless to me. Oh, but perhaps it's not. I don't see anything about it being abridged. Maybe it's just. Maybe just how long the book is. And uh, it's a illustrated edition. Somewhat illustrated anyway. You might know this story from such masterpieces as The Muppet Treasure Island or Treasure Planet. And I, since I was a teenager, probably, so I don't remember how good the book is, but you know, it's a classic that's remade all the time, so I think it's pretty good. Uh, this is one of the books in the Otherland series by Tad Williams. Uh, this is the fourth book, Sea of Silver Light. I don't know where the first three are. They must be in another book, so we might find those in a future video. Uh, this series was one of the books that that shaped my vision of virtual reality and all of the stuff associated with cyberpunk, things like that. Um, obviously, the first pioneers of that genre, like Neil Stevenson and William Gibson, like those kind of set the stage for books like Otherland to come around. Uh, I believe this was in the early aughts. And as big as this book is, all of the books in the series are this big. They, it's, it's a big series, uh, but it is about virtual reality and mostly takes place inside of virtual reality. and. Uh, is well written, is very dense but very good. The characters are phenomenal. And uh, yeah, it's been a while since I've read the entire series. I've, I've most recently, I think like five years ago, I picked up uh, the series again, and I think I got like three books in and then fell off again before I finished this one. Uh, but if you tolerate long, long narratives and you have an interest in uh, cyberpunk or virtual reality, then this is, this is a good one. We have a 
have another manga. This is Chobits uh, by Clamp. Love Clamp. Everything they do is beautiful. Chobits is adorable. It's about a little, it's a <clears throat> very fan service-y uh, story about a, this is a little robot girl, or like an android, and uh, the main protagonist guy finds her, uh, finds her in the trash, like just lying with a bunch of trash, and so he takes her home and spins her up, and uh, she comes to life and is completely adorable. And it's also very, you know, sensual and cute, and there's that element to it as well. And she doesn't really have any memories, so she tries to understand herself. And, and then I just adore Clamp's style. They, uh, Clamp is also responsible for Cardcaptor Sakura, that one is um, their, I think, one of, if not their only uh, works meant for young audiences. Most of their stuff is a bit more mature, if I'm not mistaken. It's very cute. Um, we have a photography book. Crazy photography. I don't know where I got this. It's uh, clearly an art book. I, I think it must have been given to me. Uh, it's got some... I mean, this is cool. This is I'm not super familiar with this book that I own. Uh, it's got some cool, like um, this the picture of there's there's a dude here and he's dressed up and painted to look like the log pile behind him. Uh, so I don't I don't know this photographer. Is it just one photographer? Oh. <laughs> uh, looks like mul okay, multiple photographers. Um, yeah, I guess. I guess I, I don't know where I got this, and I don't know much about it, but it's got some cool photos in here. Maybe I'll go through it sometime, maybe even in a video. I need to start gathering any, any excuse I can to make ASMR videos. Speaking of which, we are about done with this box, so thank you very much for joining me into my renewed foray into making videos and I plan to do more with, with more of uh, my boxes of books. So I'm gonna put it out into the universe. I'm gonna make that happen. It's gonna happen. So thank you for joining me. I hope you are well and I'll see you next time.